Uh, I just feel uh, led this morning as we are, you know, singing that song and the, the verse that Miss Susie read a while ago and just knowing the troubles and the, and, the, and the trials and the hard stuff that we're going through and what we're going to be focusing on today. I don't know, the Holy Spirit just put it on my heart right now just to just have a moment of prayer before we open up. Um, if you would, just, just bow, your, bow your heads and, and, and just understand this, that you are the body of Christ, not just membership in a, you know, some sort of community here in Jackson. You are, are members, if you are repentant of your sins and have trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, He has made you new, born again, new creations, united with Christ. You are part of the body of Christ, and the body of Christ here on this earth Right is finishing up the hardship, finishing up the suffering, finishing up the work that Jesus left us here to do. We are his body, he is our, 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 our mind, he is our heart, he is our strength. And our body has come in these doors just like it's going in the doors in Madison and in Florence and in Richland and everywhere else right now across the nation and across the world. The body of Christ is sometimes entering into the doors on Sunday morning limping wounded, holding their arms, holding their chest, right, hanging their heads. Now they're, they're, they're filled with guilt, filled with conviction, filled with condemnation that they cast upon themselves, that they don't need to cast upon themselves because all condemnation was paid for on the cross, right? So bow your heads right now and, and think, what is it that is your storm right now? What is it that's your burden? Because I'm here this morning burdened. I'm here this morning hurting. I'm here this morning in need of the helper which we just talked about, which we just sang about. I'm in need of my God to say, peace, be still. I'm in need of my God to show me that uh, the, the, the conviction that He's showing me, that He's given me forgiveness if I'll just turn to Him and come near to Him. The, the care that I need, He's the good shepherd who's going to care for me. The comfort that I need, He's going to comfort me as I draw near to Him. So wherever you are in that, whether you're walking in sin or walking in pain or just walking in ministry and it's really difficult, whatever your burden is, I want you to keep your eyes closed. Just, just lift your hand. It's just, I want to pray for you. If you've got a burden, lift your hand. Are you convicted of sin? Lift your hand. Are you struggling to walk through life today? Lift your hand. Are you burdened? And, I, and the hands go up and the hands go back down, the hands go back up and the hands go back down. But if I said, open up your eyes and look across this room, it's the entire body here that's gathered here as God's people. And so before we go to the Word to feed on the, living, uh, the Word that He's giving us, I want to ask for God to comfort us, to be in our midst, because that's what we're here for, right? To worship Him, to serve Him, to lean into Him, to trust in Him, and to comfort us in our time of need, because I promise you this, God knows. And so let's pray. I want to pray for you. Father, just being led by your spirit this morning, putting down all of the fluff, putting down all of the presentation, putting down all of the stuff that I tend to want to raise up sometimes, I want to say that I'm hurting. I want to say that I'm burdened. I want to say that I feel guilt. I want to say that I feel condemnation. I want to say that I feel conviction. I want to say that I feel discomfort and pain. I can honestly say that all of these things I go through on a daily basis, at some point in time, I'm burdened, beat down by this world. And God, I want, I, I want to recognize this morning that you know that, that you care for us, that you're with us. And I want to say on behalf of these people, God, draw near to us right now. Comfort our hearts, comfort our souls as you've promised to do. Speak to us about our convictions. Speak to us about our concerns. Speak to us about the areas that we're not comfortable with, Lord, and help us to know that you're with us, that you care for us, that you're in complete control, and that you want us to put our hand in your hand, and that you want us to trust in you, and want us to walk with you every step of the way, and God, help us to feel that comfort, feel that strength that you provide, only you can provide right now in our time of need. I ask these things, God, as your people, I ask these things, Lord, as, as a human being broken by my sin, God, but renewed in your strength 
renewed because of the Son of God who was sent for us to give us life and renewed because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit that resides in each and every one of us, Lord. We ask you this, and we thank you for this, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sometimes we just need to be honest with ourselves, and sometimes we need to bring that before the Lord, and hopefully we'll learn to do that every single day, all day, every day, and we can find comfort and strength that we need in times of difficulties. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 10. Honestly, I don't know exactly how this is going to come out, which is nothing new. <laughs> you know, I kind of got an idea of what I want to talk about, and, but, I, but I do want to because of uh, something that came to my attention later on uh, this week after looking at this text. I do want to cut this text basically in half and deal with it again next week. So uh, I want to pick up where we left off in Matthew chapter 10. Last week, we saw that there were the, these 12 disciples. We know the stories, uh, the story of the gospel. We know how Jesus took, he, he preached to the multitudes, but he specifically, intentionally, and prayerfully called certain men to himself to invest his life, his time, his energy into to multiply himself in them so that they can multiply themselves in others, so that they can multiply themselves in others, and we can all carry on the mission that Christ began, Right? and that Christ is continuing right now. So last week we saw how Jesus, as he's with these 12 disciples, he goes up, he prayerfully and strategically selects these guys, sets them apart, and sends them out on a ministry uh, of deliverance with a message of deliverance. The ministry actually affirms the message uh, that he's come, that the kingdom of God is at hand, and that there's deliverance available. So he sends these guys specifically into darkness, into the demon-possessed, the diseased, and the dying he says, go do this, but watch this, proclaim the gospel to these people, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so we can be delivered in a lot of ways, but if we're not delivered spiritually in that way, it doesn't matter, right? Because what matters is eternal. And so what we see is he set them on a mission, which is like, it's kind of, it's, it's important that they're doing this, but it's also a training ground for the greater mission, the great commission, that they're going to go out into the world in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and we are part of that greater mission we saw last week. And so in that text, what we saw was that we have some practical things that we can apply to our life as we're sent out. We might not call it the vocational ministry. We might be sent, not sent to another country. We might not be sent to a, a specific location that God is leading us or calling us or specifically pointing out to us, but we're called to reach out to a lost and dying world, to preach the gospel, to make disciples of the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So some practical things we looked at last week is that just as they were, we can be intentional about taking that great commission, right, taking it seriously and fulfilling the purpose of God. Don't, don't spend your time doing other things. Let that be at the forefront of your mind, that this is my purpose here is to bring glory to God and to do the work that he's left us here to do, whatever that looks like and whatever, whatever it looks like in your daily life. So we're going to be intentional on that. We're also uh, going to be gracious, or we're actually going to be life-giving because we're giving a gospel message that they need, right? We're giving a message of hope, a message of life that we're giving to them. And so we're going to be life-giving, and we're going to be urgent. We're going to call them to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. And Jesus says in this time between the first coming and the second coming, there's a, there's a window here that he's gathering people to himself, but one day that window is going to close, you know? You're not going to get another shot after that window closes. That door shuts, it's shut, it's, it's over. Does that make sense? And so what we're supposed to do is reach out to the people and let them know, hey, Jesus loves you, God wants to deliver you. Uh, from your brokenness, and he wants to bring you back to the Father, but you're not going to get another shot. Don't bank on a second uh, coming, and then, oh, after the second coming, you might have another shot. Don't bank on that. Come now. Re re repent and come to him now and receive the grace, the love that he's trying to give you. And listen, as you tell that, he says, be grateful. Be generous. Freely you, gave, uh, you were given, freely you shall. Uh, freely you received, freely you shall give. Right? You didn't do anything to earn salvation. They're not going to do anything to earn salvation. We can't. God gave it to us. He says, go out and give it to them freely. And if we have a heart of gratitude, then we are going to go, aren't we? We might be fearful. We're, we're human beings. We get scared. But we are going to go. But he tells you that when you go, be productive. Don't just cast your seeds to a hard and stony ground. Spend all your time saying, this ignorant, hard-headed feller, I'm trying to preach the gospel to him. I've, I've said it 87 different ways, and, I, and how can I say it another way to try to get it into his heart and make it bear fruit? That's what I meant by that. Don't waste your time with that. I didn't say give up on people. 
You, you don't give up on people because God at any given time can break a hard heart. He did it with mine, and he can, he's done it with many of yours, and we're praying that he does it with some of you. <laughs> I'm playing. <laughs> Seriously. Don't take all of your time pouring into and saying, okay, I'm going to neglect all these people that I could be casting seed of life and give it to them. Don't spend all your time saying, well, this is the one I really like and this is the one I really want to witness to. Witness to them. Tell them you're there for them, but don't waste your life. Spend your time doing so. God, is any, anybody else that you want me to pour into? And tell them, I don't want to argue. Here's the deal. I'm here for you. If you have any questions, if you become receptive to this, I'd be willing to answer any questions you have, but I'm going to go look for what God wants me to do. Does that make sense? Be, be productive, but be practical too. I mean, because who are those people that you're going to be trying to reach? Those that you've already got a foot in the door with. Those that you're already working with. You've already established relationships. Part of evangelism, the hard part, is to actually go to somebody that you don't know and to share with them the gospel. You've got to build a relationship. You've got to find a window, find a door. You've got to know what they believe and try to take the gospel and, and share it with them and relate it to them. But if you already know what somebody believes, you already speak the language, where do I start, God? How about with your family? How about with the ones you know the best? How about with your best friend? I know that might be a little bit uncomfortable and put a, a strain on your relationship, but how about them? Reach out to them. That's a good place to start. And then if God gives you another place, another person, another time, or another, uh, somewhere else to go and share, do that. And so be practical, be productive, but then he says, be dependent upon me. Trust in me. Because we want to try to prepare ourselves, don't we? We want to try to get it all figured out before we go, but we can spend our life trying to figure it out, and we can waste our lives never having shared his story and your story. That's all it really takes. We get scared, but all it really takes is if you have a story to tell, that Jesus changed your life, nothing you did, but you saw the goodness of the gospel, you saw your need for the gospel, you repented and trusted in him, he changed your life and began to transform you as his Holy Spirit led you, right? You take that story and you share your story and you share his story. That's a good place to start. Depend on him for the words to say, the resources and he tells you just to be faithful, faithful stewards with that gospel, to be faithful bearers of his image, faithful bearers of light, faithful bearers of love. We do it with a big heart. We do it with hearts that are willing, hearts that are loyal to him. He says, all I'm asking you to do is to be willing to receive that message into your own heart and then take that message. Be his, Valentine, <laughs> be his and be his servants, be his ones who are sent out. And now we want to pick up here and want to see that God's people must be prepared for the pains that come along with that. And we get prepared for those pains by focusing on who our God is, focusing on his purpose and his promises for us. So look with me at Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to go through 23, but I'm just going to hit on probably the first half of verse, one, uh, verse 16. So let's look at it. Verse 16, it says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes." And so the first thing that we see is that Jesus is preparing these disciples. Now, he's giving them uh, an idea of what it's going to look like in the future, future ministry that's going to take place. But he's preparing them for the pains of ministry. You would think God calls you to do something. God directs you to do something. God instructs you. God is a good and just and holy, righteous God, right? So anything that God is giving to you, you think it should be, it's going to be good. And so there's these expectations that come. With it, Well, if God's given this to me, he'll never put on me more than I can handle. You never heard that? Heard it this week. I affirmed it in a way this week, but absolutely he'll put on you way more than you can handle. Because you can't do anything without him. That's not what the scripture says. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Does that make sense? 
Come on now, you can't do it on your own. There's a lot that you can't handle. But God says he's with you. So some of the time, sometimes we think when God gives us something, especially the main mission that we're given, there's this expectation that this is going to be, man, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be all roses. You've got a message of hope. You've got a message of salvation. You've got a message that everybody and their mama needs, right? Everyone. So there's this expectation that it must be a good thing that God is sending us out to do. It is a good thing when you look at the whole picture It is a wonderful thing that God is sending you to do, and it's worth dying for. But here's what Jesus says. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Anybody seen Discovery Channel? (laughs) Animal Planet, right? We've all seen those those, uh, documentaries or whatever. We know what happens when you put a little old gazelle, right, and a lion together. There's a predator and there's a prey. And I, you just use your imagination here. you got a flock, or what do you call them? Yeah, a flock of sheep, and, the, and they're being led by this shepherd. And he says, go into this field, and it's filled with ravenous wolves. And you see them just following, just blindly following the shepherd. And the shepherd looks, he sees over there, he sees all of those wolves. And he doesn't pay any attention to them. He says, go ahead, sheep, go on into the midst of those wolves. Just use your imagination. He likes to use imagery, doesn't he? He likes to get your attention with stories, doesn't he? He's giving you a picture. What would happen? Sheep in the midst of wolves. Destroy them. Tear them up. Tear them to pieces. I mean, use your imagination. You've seen enough Discovery Channel to see this, to know what's going to happen. Chances are, sheep are going to be killed. Blood is going to be everywhere. Forgive me for getting graphic. I won't get too much more uh, graphic. But you know the image. It's going to be hard. It's going to be painful. And when that happens, there's going to be a temptation to think this shepherd doesn't know what he's doing. These sheep are absolutely stupid for following this. This is a futile attempt to follow this shepherd. This shepherd is ignorant at best, right? Or straight up heartless and cruel and hateful at worst. And it brings my uh, attention to what you just read a while ago. As they're in the boat and the storms and the chaos and all of this stuff's going on all around them, they're fending for their lives, right? Didn't Jesus tell them to get in the boat? Didn't Jesus send them across? Right, Did, is Jesus not able to, to discern that, that sea, there, there's storms that come upon that sea. At all, at all, it could come in, in the middle of nowhere, right? It could just come, just out of nowhere. He knows that, and he's God, so he already knows it's going to come. And he says, go out in the midst of that storm. They're going crazy. And the first thing they do is they get up and they say, teacher, don't you care? Wake up. How can you sleep in a time like this? Don't you care that we're drowning? Don't you care that we're dying, right? Because if they were not worried about that, if, they, if, they, if they, they've seen Jesus do miracles, now they're assuming because they're going through hard stuff, hard stuff that Jesus actually led them into, now they're assuming that he doesn't care for them or maybe that he's not even able. Get up and do something. But he's God who can do anything, right? So they're questioning his character. It's exactly what you would do if you saw a shepherd leading people in. You're watching Discovery Channel. You see this happen. The shepherd looks up. He looks at the sheep, uh, the wolves. He looks at the sheep. He says, come on, sheep. You're saying, that guy has lost his mind. He doesn't, he doesn't qualify to be a shepherd. So why is Jesus telling them this? He's telling them this to say this is not going to be easy. Number one, discipleship itself, following Jesus' commands, which he says, if you love me, John 14, you will keep my commands. Well, that's tough. That's tough. You will not put on me more than I can bear. You absolutely will because I can't keep your commands, right? But you've given me the helper, the Holy Spirit, and you've told me that you are the vine and, and, and that I'm supposed to trust in you, right? And then in you I can do all things. Does that make sense? And, and so he's, he's telling them this to be prepared for this. It's going to be difficult. Discipleship is difficult. So when you're making, becoming a disciple who's a follower of Christ, part of that discipleship is to go proclaim the gospel. Part of that discipleship is to make disciples who you're teaching to make disciples and to follow Jesus. That's a difficult task, and it's not going to be easy. It's not easy to study the Bible on your own. It's not easy to pray on your own. It's not easy to take every thought captive. And it sure is not easy to go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation, is it? That's a difficult thing to do to overcome fears. It's a difficult thing to do when you are met by resistance. Who are they sent out to? First, the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus says, I don't want you to have the wrong idea. 
I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is going to be a dangerous task. Wait a second. These are our people. Israelites, just like us. Same background, same culture, same way of thinking, same expectations. These people are looking for salvation. These people are looking for a king. These people are looking for a kingdom. These people want a relationship with God. All of that's good. And so when I bring this wonderful message to them, the expectation is Israel will respond. Right? I'm giving you something you need. If all of you said, I want a hamburger right now, and I brought a whole basket full of hamburgers, every one of y'all would say, give us a hamburger. Right? I don't know, maybe some of y'all are vegans, but I would want one. He says it's not going to be like that. He says they're going to turn you over to be flogged in the synagogues. You're going to beat, be beaten, be scourged. You're going to be thrown into prison. You're going to be put to death. And he says, and don't think you're going to get any special treatment from those who are close to you or your relatives or your friends. For he says, father will turn against son. Son will turn against father and mother, right? Brother against brother. The ones who are supposed to love you. I said that in the funeral the other day. I said, man, when I'm talking about siblings, I know, I know the, the feuds, I know the fights, but I also know the fellowship that we have. That blood is thicker than water. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to trusting in Jesus, there is not peace that just spreads through this whole world whenever we preach the gospel. What happens is some people take a hold of it and the rest of the whole house uh, might, might not. And so he says, I didn't come to bring what? Peace. Next page. But I came to bring a sword. Not that he wants to bring division. He does come to offer peace, right? It's just the fact that some people have their own choice and some people choose to walk away and some people choose not to receive that grace. So what happens when we latch on to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords and we see him for who he truly is and there's no way you're taking my mitts off of him because I need him, everyone else looks and it causes division. We don't want that. Does that make sense? He says, it's not going to, you're not even going to be received by your own people. They're actually going to turn against you. This is not pretty. They're going to, it's going to cause you to question your master. It's going to cause you to question the whole mission that he's given you, isn't it? It's going to cause you to think something is wrong, right? God's not in this. God must not be blessing this. God, I must have misinterpreted the mission, and I must have misinterpreted who this God is that I'm following. It's going to cause you to question him, isn't it? Maybe redirect your attention and say, well, I'm going to go do something else. Maybe call you to redefine the mission that he gave you. I know he said go out, and I know he said preach, and I know he said whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my fathers in heaven. Whoever denies me before man, I will deny before my fathers in heaven. I know he said that, but what he meant by confess and what he meant by go and tell is X, Y, or Z. Redefine it to do what you want to do rather than what God said do. There's a temptation to do that, and Jesus doesn't want them to be shocked when hard stuff comes their way. And Jesus doesn't want them to start questioning his character and thinking that he is hurtful, that he is just doing this arbitrarily, that there's no purpose in it, that it's, you're going to come to the point when you face that, you're going to think, this is futile, this is pointless. What are we going out for? People are hurting us. This can't be of God. He says, oh, it absolutely can be of God. <coughs> it will seem foolish, but when you look at the bigger picture, when you look at eternal things rather than temporary, it's going to all make sense, and it's all worthwhile. <coughs> so you've got firefighters. You've got police officers. You've got military. You might military in here. You, you've got all of these positions that if you didn't know what they did, if you didn't know the purpose for those jobs, and you just looked at the activities, the circumstances surrounding those jobs, what do you do for a living? Well, I run toward a fire. I go in the fire, right? And then I get stuff done and I come out of the fire. You would think you're an absolute fool. Whoever sent you in there, your commanding officer, is a fool. That's crazy. Crazy talk. Police officer, what do you do? Well, I go and I run towards crime, right? <laughs> I run towards criminals. And the person, well, that sounds absolutely silly. Why would you run towards criminals? We're trying to get away from them, right? We want to protect our stuff. And then you got people who put on these vests. They take up their guns, they put on their boots, and they actually, what do you do for a living? Man, I, I actually go towards an en enemy line who is shooting tank, uh, uh, is shooting missiles at me, is shooting bullets at me. That's what I do. All of those things, if you didn't look at the bigger picture, if you just focused on those simple things, you would think, you have lost your mind. This is absolutely foolish. Don't even try to do that. But already you went ahead of me, didn't you? You already went ahead of me. What does a firefighter do? 
They serve and protect. Protect lives first and foremost. Search and rescue. You get in there. You make sure that nobody's in there. And you try your best to get them out. You're trying to preserve life. And you're trying to preserve property the best you can. You're doing that for a purpose. And then you've got police officers running to, uh, to detain criminals, right? So that they can't take your stuff or take your life. They're protecting your life. They're protecting your liberty in the same way with the military. Protecting your liberty. Protecting your freedom. Protecting your lives. When you look at it from that perspective... When you see the mission that they're doing, but you see the purpose of that mission, well, then these people don't seem like fools at all, do they? They seem courageous. They seem that they're bought into a cause that they believe in. They're, and and they're, 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 there's, there's fear. I can tell you there's fear in running towards a fire. There's fear if, if you're a police officer running towards a drug bust at a house. There's fear when you're running after someone not knowing if they're going to shoot at you or not. And there's fear when another army is coming at you. But when you've got that greater cause, it's worth Losing your life for. It's heroic. And he says, I know it's going to seem difficult. I'm sending you out. And it's almost as graphic as sheep in the midst of wolves. Because you're going into a dark world that is resistant and rebellious against God. And resistant and rebellious against his son. Resistant and rebellious against his people, his servants. It's going to be difficult. It's going to cause you to be tempted in that moment. To uh, retrace or to redefine and then redirect and redeem. Reject what God has given you. He says, but I want to tell you to stay firm. Continue to trust. Continue to follow. Why? Because it's not pointless. It's not futile. Because the point of it all is what? To seek and to save that which is lost. In the midst of that battlefield that you're going into, that I'm sending you into as your commanding officer, in the midst of that battlefield, there are other people in need of rescue. Jesus said what? That's exactly what he did. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when you think about him in glory, perfect peace, perfect harmony, perfect fellowship, right? All of this, a perfect scenario there, but love drove him. We see a broken world in this temporary world that we live in, a rebellious and fallen world. The Son of God took on flesh, entered into darkness, went against the resistance, right? He came to his own and his own people didn't receive. Now he's talking about the Israelites, but when you really think about it from a broader perspective, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God came to the own, his own people that he created, and his own people that he chose out of those he created, and they did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus came, taking the fiery darts of the enemy, went against the grain, pushed against that as light in the midst of darkness, endured much hardship, like Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Right? Jesus did all those things. And in the book of Hebrews, he tells us this. He says, he says for the joy that was set before him, he did what? He endured that cross. What joy? Is there joy in suffering? Is there joy in pain? You got a sling on your arm. Is there joy in that? Does it feel good? Is there joy in falling down and hitting your head? (laughs) Laying there? It's not joyful. Pain is not joyful unless there's a greater purpose in that. And he says, for the joy that was set before him, not the scourging, not the flogging, not the dying on the cross, absorbing the total wrath, right, that we have stored up against, uh, against ourselves because we've rebelled against God. That's not joyful. What's joyful is the end result. When he conquers sin and death and he rose from the grave, what's joyful is some people will see, some people will hear, and some people will receive the gift of eternal life that he came to pay for our sins right on that cross. He rose from the grave and some people will hear that message and respond to that message and place their faith in him and spend eternity in glory. He's come, he's come to seek and save the lost, to suffer to do that. He died and he rose from the grave to give us life, and that's worth suffering for. And he says the same thing for each and every one of us. Just as he's uh, come to this world and he's been hated and he's been hurt, he says, if they hate me, they're going to hate you also. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. Don't be surprised if the world hates you, right? If you're of the world, it would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And he says, remember what I've told you. He says, you're going to have the Holy Spirit You're going to have the helper who's going to be with you to help you walk through this. And so here's the deal. All of us have probably experienced this on some level, haven't we? 
We started following Jesus, and it got really difficult, didn't it? Maybe you were ridiculed. Maybe you rejected. Maybe you attempted to share the gospel. Somebody rejected that. Somebody who was dear to you rejected that. And now that, that relationship is severed. Because I really can't go through the room and say, y'all have been persecuted. Y'all have been flogged. Y'all have been brought before the synagogues and beaten. Has anybody suffered severely for their faith yet? It's likely to come. The chances are you've tried to follow Jesus and you were made fun of. The chances are you've tried to share Jesus and people say, we don't want that. And then that relationship was way different than it was when you first started. Chances are you've gotten pushback. You're trying to share with people that you love deeply. Your family and your own family says, we don't want to hear that mess. Will you stop being, stop bringing that up? But what he's really saying is stop being you. Stop being who you were recreated to be. How can you stop being you when you're born again? How can you stop being in love with Jesus? You can't. So what happens is there's friction, there's pain, and that's pain's going to come from some of the people that you care for the most. People that you want to, you're longing for, for them to receive salvation. You're longing for that uh, the most, and that pain is going to come from them. They're going to hurt you. I can't tell you how many times I've suffered rejection from those who I cared about deeply, simply by trying to carry out the mission. And so there's a temptation. God, if people aren't responding, if my family's not responding, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe you're not in this. Maybe you didn't call me to this. Maybe you didn't, and I start going through the list. This is pointless. This is futile. This is, this is foolish what I'm trying to do. Why, not I just, why don't I just go back to what I was doing? Why don't I just go back to the world? At least the world accepted me, right? At least I felt loved and I felt accepted, and so there's a temptation there. Has anybody been there? Just go back. Jesus is saying, hey, don't go back. Trust in me. I've got a greater purpose in this. I have made promises to you that are not temporary promises, that are eternal promises. And when you put it in that perspective, that no matter what pain I go through uh, here, no matter what rejection I go through here, even to the point of death, as David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. God, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And he goes on to say what? I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? I will dwell in this earth and for a little minute amount of time. No. The house of the Lord forever. No matter what I do, you're with me. Right? You have given me great promises and that promise is your presence with me even to the ends of the age. Isn't that awesome? And so no matter what we go through here, we're going to feel tension. We're going to feel pain because we live in a broken and fallen world where there's sin, people in rebellion against God, the influence of the enemy in this world, of course, against the God who created us, right? And so when we become part of that team, now we have an enemy that we're going against. It's going to be difficult. But when you look at the greater picture, that Jesus came because he cares for you. We love, why? Come on. Because he first loved us. So don't start thinking your shepherd doesn't care for you. Don't start thinking that because he came after you, called you, set you apart, saved you for himself because he loves you, adopted you as a son and daughter because he cares. And guess what? He sends you out with a mission because he cares, because he loves and he cares for them. And if this was the end of the, of the rope, if this earth was all there was, it would definitely look like he doesn't care for us. But since there's a promise that we take our last breath here, we take our first breath in the presence of Almighty God, that there's an eternity to spend in perfect peace, in perfect harmony, in perfect fellowship with Him. When you look at it from that perspective, it's worth dying for. That's exactly what Paul says. I count it all loss, right? And I press on towards the goal for which he's called me. He sits in prison. He's flogged. He's beaten. He's gone through shipwrecks. He's gone through many trials and difficulties for the sake of the gospel. Why? Because he knows this ain't the end of the story. Pardon my grammar. <laughs> this isn't the end. He knows that there's a God who's promised, a God who's going to provide, a God who is with him, not here only, but forevermore as well. As I close this, I'm thinking about this, just these few words right here at the beginning of chapter 16. I mean, at verse 16. Few words that caught my attention. That I was going to keep going through this and talk about how we're supposed to be wise as, as, as serpents and and innocent as doves, but these three words, are they caught me this week, and I thought, this makes the mission, this makes obedience, it makes it a non-negotiable, right? But it also is so satisfying and so comforting, because in these words right here, you have, you have authority and you have assurance. He says, verse 16, behold, 
Yours might say, I am sending you. Mine says, behold, I send you out. Right? Who's saying that? You got the answer book over here. <laughs> Is it your youth pastor? Is it your spiritual leader? Is it your pastor that's saying it? It's not your mother, your grandmother, your best friend, not the person you most greatly respect here on this earth, the one that you would do anything. So everybody look around in here. You could find somebody here. If Larry Black asked you to do something, you'd bend over backwards to try to make it happen because you love him and care for him and respect him, right? Most. I've seen some people do that. <laughs> I'd do it. I'd help you. If my mother asked me to do something, I'm going to try my best to make that happen. No questions asked. I'm going to go through great pains to try to make that happen. I'm going to try my best, knowing I'm not going to be 100% successful, knowing I'm going to shrink back some, but I'm going to take that. I'm going to say, okay, Mom, I'm going to try to make this work because I respect you, because I love you, and you're worth it. Who is this telling them to go? Who says I send you? It's Jesus. What did Jesus say? He says, I am the bread of life. What else did he say? I am the light of the world. I'm the door, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the resurrection and the life, right? What else? He says, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. What else does he say? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he finally, he says, I'm the true vine. In all of these things, he's saying, I'm your life giver, I'm your sustainer, I'm your leader, I'm your comforter, I'm your shelter, I'm everything that you need for life and for godliness to live forevermore. I'm all of those things. How is he all of those things? Because of that statement, I am. Those words, I am, what does that mean? Takes you back to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. There's another man who's called, another man who's set apart, Another man who's put on a mission for God and for his glory to take his people, Israel, and to bring them out of bondage, out of slavery, to go and worship the one true God. And, and he says, I'm sending you to Pharaoh and the Egyptians and the taskmasters to do that. And he says, uh, I can't. What does God say? <laughs> he says, I'm with you. It's exactly what he says. I'm with you. Well, who, who should I tell the Israelites uh, th that you are, if I'm going to do this, who should I tell you? He says, I am who I am. I'm the self-sustaining, self-governing, ever-present, almighty God. That's the one who's with you. That's the one who's commanded you. That's the one who sent you. And that's the one who sees the pain, the, the, the discomfort of the people that cares deeply for the people and wants to bring them out of darkness into the light to worship the one true God. He says, I'm sending you. I'm with you. Now go. So there's authority and there's also what? Great assurance, because it's the almighty God of the universe who says, I am. And what does he say in John's gospel, chapter 8, verse 58, I think? He says, before Abraham was, Jesus says, I am. Right? This is God telling you. This isn't your favorite actor. This isn't the president of the United States, former or whatever, <laughs> the ones that you would do anything for. This is your commanding officer. He is the God of the universe. Amen? And he said, I send you. That's non-negotiable. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Make disciples of all nations. But then he packs that with a, with a great punch at the end. He says, and I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. So that authority says, go, we should go because of who he is. He is worthy, amen? amen. If it was somebody else, we'd do anything. But if it's Jesus, the God of the universe, the Son of God in the flesh, that tells us we try to do everything but what he says. And that's sad. That's how I am sometimes. But he says, I'm with you always. I send you out into the midst of wolves. Guess what? I'm the good shepherd. I've made promises to you. I will keep my promises to you. And so be faithful to trust in me. And so when we're going through these difficult times, when we're feeling rejected and feeling alone, who, who else went through that? Jesus. So who better to put your hand in than his hand? The hand who's going to carry you through from these temporary, momentary afflictions and he's going to bring you to the weight of eternal glory in his presence forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you again for your love and for your mercy and for your grace. And we thank you again for just your word that is so powerful, God, that brings such a punch with it. God, it wakes us up. It reminds us of who you are, how much you love us, and how much you care for us. 
It reminds us of what our responsibility is, is because you loved us, Lord, you desire for us to love you back and to care and to, and, and to take your mission that you've given us and to carry it to a lost and dying world. Father, we know that we're not alone in this. We know that we're in this together. We know that the pressure is really not on us. It's on you because you've promised to provide for us everything that we need for life and godliness as we go. We just need, we need confidence. We need assurance. God, we need strength. We need comfort. We need to be courageous. And the way in which we do that is not grabbing all that we can from within us. It's grabbing towards you, leaning on you and trusting in you because in you we can do all things. And so I pray that we will turn our attention to you with all of our fears, all of our failures, all of our struggles. God, everything that says don't do what you've told us to do, we bring those things to you, we confess those things before you, and we ask you to give us the strength that we need to carry your love to a lost and dying world. and Give us the strength that we need to endure whatever hardship comes our way and help us to remain focused on who you are and what you've promised us so that we can stand on that hope and stand in your love. We love you, we thank you, we praise you for all that you're doing right now and all that you will do in the future. I pray that you'll grip a heart and bring them to yourself today. Help them to find, their fa- help them to find salvation in you this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen.